one of the things that I'm increasingly growing in is I love the body of Christ. And the body is not just one part or one piece. It's not just me. It's not just Julie. It's not a praise team member. It's all of us. All of us have gifts, and the Lord is distributing his gifts appropriately across the body. And I want you to know this. If you're, if you're watching this and you're like, this is a little bit different, good. Because what I want you to see is I want you to see how the Lord has need for all of us in the room. All of us. And one of the ways that is hard for me to do but is necessary is that my favorite thing to do as far as pastor, probably other than baby dedications, is to preach. I love to preach. But every so often we need to have a different voice from a different perspective. Because the Lord equips and he uses many, many people for that purpose. Now, if you're new here, you'll, you'll find out very quickly that we love missionaries. We love missions. This church, throughout the year, will give about 50 some thousand dollars to some type of missionary project outside of this church. We have a lot of what we call windows, which are short speakers. We'll share five to ten minutes about what the Lord is doing. But every so often, the Lord puts someone upon my heart to share for the message. And this morning, Sean and Megan Deal are friends of ours. They've been here a couple, couple times. Okay, I'm going to ruin you for a minute. If you take Josh Kane, wherever Josh Kane is at, and put him with Troy Wade, you have Sean Deal. <laughs> Troy, stand up for a minute. I know you could beat me, but I cannot run you today. There, <laughs> Troy is one of my favorites. Sean looks, <laughs> looks like him, but Sean is a great missionary. We're a great missionary family to a country that's becoming increasingly dear to our hearts with the country of Uganda. Would you welcome my friend this morning, Sean Deal. Thank you so much. I also used to pastor, and I also love to preach. And so, Pastor Paul, I know how hard it is for you to give this pulpit up to me today, but I appreciate it so much, and I'm going to brag to all my missionary friends that I got to preach at Licking. No, I love it. I love it, man, and I loved hearing my brother and the accent. I know you were praying, but it felt like I was back home for a moment. Where are you from originally? Okay. I love Nigeria. I got arrested there. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> they just wanted a bribe. I was 14 years old. We flew in from Equatorial Guinea for the, uh, general, the 50th anniversary of the Islamism of God in Nigeria, and they saw my passport that I had to go in and out of Kenya for my boarding school, and so they accused me of being a drug dealer. A missionary kid, 14 years old, but I was a drug dealer, so they, they arrested me, they held me for three hours until they got the money from my dad that they wanted. So yeah, that's my Nigeria story. But... <laughs> But the, there's better stories that I'm going to tell today. But uh, it's awesome. It's awesome, man. You know, we, we have a, a playlist on our, on our iTunes that we call our, well, I call it the itineration pump up. And we love Africa. We love living in Africa and we love Africa worship. And so we have some Africa songs on that and that, Today was the first time I almost made it through one of the songs without crying. So we're, I'm getting better. I'm getting better. But one of the songs on that list, you may know, it's from Nigeria. It's called Nara. And, and it, it starts off with these lyrics. He's done so much for me. I cannot tell it all. Nara kale o. Then the next words are, if I had 10,000 tongues, they still wouldn't be enough. Now, I'm not going to use 10,000 words today. I'm going to use about 3,000. But they are not going to be enough for me to tell you the great things that are happening in Uganda. They are not going to be enough to tell you thank you for investing in us because of you. We stand here amazed at what God has done in our first term in Uganda. I'm here with my amazing missionary wife, Megan Deal. Megan, stand up, say hi. Yeah, she's the best. She's such a great missionary. She started preaching in Uganda, and she's good. 
she gets don't she don't she's gonna be mad at me for saying that because now Larissa and Julia are probably gonna like invite her to come speak at a women's event here, but you should. She's that good. I'm not looking at her right now. So <laughs> it's all I got security, so we're good. But I love this church. I love how much you invest in missions, and, and we are a product of that. One of the things I love about the Assemblies of God in the U.S. is the rural church. I was never called to pastor a rural church. I'm a city guy. But I know that we cannot have missions without the rural church of America. If I look at the list of my supporting churches, over 80% are from rural America. You are the strength of the Assemblies of God. The reason why we are reaching the world with the Assemblies of God is because of rural churches in America. So I would much rather be in a rural church than the biggest city church there is. Because you, you are who's changing the world. And so what I want you to do right now before I start talking anymore is I want you to give a hand to Jesus and a hand to you for using you to just absolutely rock this world for Jesus. In 2021, Megan and I arrived in Zanzibar because Uganda was still on lockdown. We went there to learn some Swahili, to eat some food, and I even had a sandwich named after me there. It was Jita Kubwa, which was the nickname they gave me. It means the big giant. <laughs> they had never seen anybody my size. They, when I would lift weights, they would call out on the street, say, Jita Kubwa's lifting, and they would have 30, 40 people come off the street to watch me lift. I felt like a celebrity and a zoo animal all in one. And if you're asking if I complain about it, not at all. I love the attention. I loved it. It was amazing. As some of you may know or may not, Zanzibar is a Muslim nation. While there, though, I had an epiphany that for will ever change the way I do missions and the way we do missions in Uganda. And as some of God World Missions Africa... We have a vision statement which drives everything that we do. You may have heard it from other African missionaries. You may have seen it on their Facebook posts or videos. It's this. We want to see a church planted within walking distance of every African on the continent. Now, in our last itineration, I was here twice. And you didn't hear it from me. Every video that I did, you did not hear that from me. Every Facebook post I made, I did not put it in there. Not because I don't like it, not because I don't like how it sounds. I love it. It's a beautiful vision statement. But I thought it was impossible to do. And so I didn't want to come and tell you, looking as soon as a God, that we're going to go and plant a church within walking distance of every Ugandan because I didn't want to lie to you. I didn't want to say I was going to do something that I didn't think that I could accomplish. And so I didn't say it. And so we go to Zanzibar, a Muslim nation. When the call to prayer would go out, we would hear it from all four sides of our house, four different mosques. When we'd be in Swahili school, we would hear it from down the street, our, the largest mosque in Zanzibar. When we would drive through poor neighborhoods, rich neighborhoods, tourist neighborhoods, we saw mosques. When we drove across the, the island, every single village had a mosque. One day Megan said, there is a mosque everywhere here. And that's when it hit me. There was a mosque within walking distance of every Zanzibari. And I was broken. I was convicted. I thought to myself, if the Muslims can do it, why can't we? Why can't we? Yes, it's impossible. But nothing is impossible with God. So to say that I was ready to go to Uganda and plant a church is an understatement. 
Megan and I wanted to plant a church with all our hearts, but not just any kind of church. We desired to plant a church that would plant churches. We felt that God was calling us to do the impossible. And as God was preparing us to do the impossible, he was already preparing other people who were already seeing the impossible happen in Uganda. One of those young men is... Emmanuel Okoth. Emmanuel Okoth was a pastor's son. But then when he hit his teen years, he decided to rebel. He started using drugs and he started going off another way. But right before he was about to graduate from his secondary school, God began to work in his heart and he gave his heart back to Jesus and was radically, radically transformed. Yet God called him to do the impossible. He told Emmanuel to enroll at the Islamic University of Uganda. Now at that school, if you are seen carrying your Bible, it's immediate expulsion. If you pray and they see you, immediate expulsion. And so Emmanuel did not understand why God was telling him to do it, but he obeyed anyway. And so he enrolled, and once he was there, if you ever meet Emmanuel, this will come as no surprise to you. You'll probably meet him in August. He started a Bible study. Started a secret underground Bible study. The first time they had it, they had six people. Within a year, they had 200. And they had to sneak off campus and begin to have their meetings in a church outside of the university. By the time he finished, Emmanuel, they had 400 students coming every single week to this Bible study. And the imam of the school told his professors, you leave him alone, he's a man of God. And so Emmanuel would walk around with his Bible. He would pray for people. He was making a difference. And today, at the Islamic University of Uganda, there is an Islamic University Christian Union. It's recognized by the school. Nothing is impossible with God. We arrived to Uganda soon after Emmanuel graduated And God soon had our paths meet. While we wanted to plant a church, it wasn't quite yet time. And the general superintendent, he met me and he asked me to do one thing. He asked me to work alongside the National Youth Department and help raise a new generation of leaders to reach Uganda. Now let me me explain. Youth in Uganda is 13 to 35. So... So it's basically youth and young adults. So I'm not just working with teenagers. I'm working with pra- practically the whole nation. Because 83% of the country is on the, under the age of 35. And so he gave me that task. And since we weren't going to be able to plant the church, I said, well, this is the energy that I'm going to put all my missions in. I, I have a church in Licking, Missouri that has invested in us. They expect a return, so I'm going to give 100% to this. So I began to pray, and I knew I was going to be meeting with the regional leaders in a couple of weeks. And so I began to pray to God to give me a plan, to give me a strategy that we could use. And I felt like he did. I felt like God was directing me to have us do youth conferences in 2022 as the nation was coming out of lockdown. There hadn't been church for two years. They hadn't seen anybody from the National Youth Department or even their regional leaders for two years. I said, we need to go out and we need to go see them. We need to have these youth conferences and begin to tell our young people it's time. Lockdown is over. COVID is over. Let's go and reach our nation. And then in 2023, we can continue those youth conferences, but have a national youth leaders conference where we bring all the youth leaders and the youth pastors together to help them either continue with their youth group or launch a youth group in their church. And then in 2024, 
we can all come together and have the first ever national youth conference in Uganda. And from that, in 2025, we can start planting churches to reach young Ugandans. I loved the plan. I was so excited to tell these people the plan. And as we were driving to Kampala from Ginger, where we lived, it's a 50-mile drive that takes three hours on a good day. It's so nice, these roads here. I love it. I'm getting spoiled. But on the drive there, I felt like God tell me, Sean, you keep your mouth shut today. I was, like, I was like, you sure about that, God? <laughs> I mean, this plan's kind of genius. And I didn't just come up with it. I felt like you gave it to me. And he said, you keep your mouth shut today. You just listen. You don't know these guys. You don't know these people. You've been in Uganda less than a month. You don't know anything. You just listen. And so I walked in and I met Josh, Joshua, the national youth director. I'm the biggest guy in the Uganda in the Sumas of God. He's the smallest. We make quite a pair, <laughs> especially when he's interpreting for me because he gets all like fired up. He's, he's fun. We love, oh, he's my brother. Traveled to Kenya with him. We drove. I had the AC on the lowest setting and he was like all freezing. And I'm like, bro, it doesn't get any lower. I'm sorry. My wife, she rides with a blanket. I met Emmanuel Koth, I met Emmanuel Atepo, and I met Cosmos and Morris and Joshua Okello. I met Jocelyn, and, and, and I was like, this is such an awesome group. It's a shame I can't tell them my plan. And they said, Missionary Sean, we've typed up our vision for the next few years. Would you care to take a look at it and tell us what you think? I said, I'd love to. In 2021, or 2022, we would like to start doing youth conferences across the country. In 2023, we want to continue those youth conferences, but we want to have a National Youth Leaders Conference where we bring all the youth leaders and the youth pastors together to help train them and equip them so they can either grow their youth groups or launch one. In 2024, we want to have the first ever National Youth Conference where we bring all the young people together. And in 2025, we want to start planting churches. What do you think about that, Missionary Sean? I said, let's get it started. I said, we can do this. Here's the thing. When God has a plan, he doesn't just tell missionaries. He tells the national church. That's what AGWM is all about. It's not the missionary's vision and the church's vision. It is God's vision. And in Uganda, we are got, we're seeing it happen. We're seeing it firsthand. We started those youth conferences a little over two years ago. The first one was up in a mountain. We just got in our Speed the Light truck and we drove up this dirt road. The battery died in the village. They had one battery in town. Thankfully, we didn't stay up at the top of that hill. But we had over 500 at that place. We saw hundreds saved and healed and filled with the Holy Spirit. And we just saw that happen again and again and again in every youth conference. Last year, we had the National Youth Leaders Conference. We had... 124 young people there. And what was so amazing about that event what was that it was the first event in the history of Uganda and the of God that every, everybody there paid their own way. They had never had that happen before. They had never, with the pastors, or it, they, it was a historic event. The youth are leading the way in Uganda. This year's youth conferences doubled what they had last year. Revival is spreading. These young people after the youth conferences are like, we got to go. We got to go and tell people. We have people that walk 20 miles to get to a youth conference. They are hungry. It's amazing. And we get to be a part of it. 
at that National Youth Leaders Conference. As we were praying, God put it on our hearts as a leadership team that we, the National Youth Department, are the ones to begin to plant churches in Uganda. Though the Assemblies of God has been in Uganda for over 40 years, we still do not have churches in the cities, including the capital city of Kampala, which has over 4 million people. Over 4 million people, and we do not have a single Assemblies of God church. And as a National Youth Department, we looked at ourselves and we said, we are the ones to do it. And we are going to see it happen. God has called us to the impossible task of planting a church within walking distance of every Ugandan. And it is impossible until we plant one. And so at the end of the term, our general superintendent, Bishop Henry, he came to me. He said, Sean, you have a lot of young, amazing leaders, but they have grown up in the villages. They only know one way. None of them have theological education. None of them have pastoral experience. You and Megan are the ones. And he asked, will you and Megan plant the church that you've been dreaming of in Kampala when you come back. And I said, I didn't forget my dream. I know this is God. Yes, when we come back, we will plant the church. And it's not just going to be any church. It's going to be a church where young, dynamic leaders come and they are trained, and they are equipped, and they, they get church planting training, they get Bible school training, and then they will be launched out from the church to plant churches in the cities and then in the villages. This generation, I have said it from the time I arrived in Uganda because I believe it. This generation of Ugandans is going to be the generation that sees a church planted within walking distance of every Ugandan. Yes, it is impossible, but I've said it once, I've said it twice, and I'm going to say it five or six more times today. Nothing is impossible with God. Hudson Taylor, a missionary from the 1800s, said this about God doing the impossible in our lives. He said there are three stages to every great work of God. First, it's impossible. Then it is difficult. And then it is done. For those of you taking notes, let me say those again. I'll even make you help me. First, it's impossible. What's first? Impossible. impossible. Then it's difficult. What comes next? And then it's done. Everybody say, it's done. I love that part. Anytime I think of God doing the impossible, I think of my favorite story in the Bible. And why is it my favorite story in the Bible? Megan actually said on the way up, she's like, you fit this story into every sermon you have. Because it's an all-you-can-eat event, y'all. So go ahead and open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14. And for the young people that are probably going, he's just now starting to preach. No, I've been preaching. I've just been telling stories. Because the last time I itinerated, I didn't have any stories to tell. I just, had, I just had what we hoped to do. So I had to preach longer, tell stories shorter. Now I tell stories longer and preach shorter. I'm also an expository preacher. But I get through the books a little pa faster than Pastor Paul. He's great. <laughs> Took me a year and a half to get through John. Let's see how long it takes him to get through Romans. No, you guys have a great... Everybody give a hand to your pastor. He's the best. He's the best. There, there's a reason why I, I wanted to preach expository, teach, uh, expository preaching in Uganda. They picked him because he's better at it than I am. So I am very happy you're going. Matthew chapter 14, we're going to start in 15. I feel so comfortable here. Sorry, guys. I love it. I mean, come on. I got to hear a story about poo. I just, like, 
I'm, oh, I knew I was in the right place today, not just because I was wearing red, but because she said poo. I was like, yeah, that's my place. <laughs> Love it. Megan, I'm just quoting. I was just quoting. Verse 15. That evening the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, that isn't necessary. You feed them. But we only have five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. First, it's what? Impossible. It's impossible. Jesus is asking the disciples to do the impossible. There's just no way they can feed this crowd. They don't have the finances. They don't have the manpower. They don't have the food. They don't have the skills. But this is what kingdom work looks like. Kingdom work starts with an empty basket. We want to have a full one and then start working, but that's not how it goes. We start with nothing and then take the step of faith and God starts making the impossible happen. You get this. Of any church that I can think of in Southern Missouri, you get this. A 24-year-old pastor with a 60-year-old, on average, congregation of 20 people. Or less than 20 people. Were you here? Way to stick it out. In a small building... This was an impossible dream. Napa didn't even know how it was going to happen. For those of you that don't know, this used to be a Napa place. That's a great inside joke. I worked it up on the way here, so laugh. That was really good. It's just not done, y'all. A young, inexperienced pastor and his wife who had never pastored before come to a community that isn't very large. It's 2,000 people. Less if you don't count the prisoners. I don't know. It's a small community. This is impossible. All Pastor Paul and Licking Assembly of God had was an empty basket. But God called you to reach your community, and your community is being reached. And not just your community. Look out at your missions wall. You're reaching the world. I look at, I looked at your BGM goal of $3,000, and you already have like almost half that. And we're not even in May yet. Your kids even get it. This is a church that believes that there's nothing impossible with God. You live it out. Because, yeah, first it's impossible. We have pastors and youth pastors that don't have physical copies of the Bible. God told Megan, get them Bibles. We didn't have any money. We had no way to ship them in. But God told Megan to do it. We had an empty basket. We don't have any churches in the cities of Uganda, but God told a group of people that had never pastored a church other than my wife and I. A bunch of young people who grew up in villages. God told us to go plant the churches in the cities, and we said, yes, we don't have the finances, we don't have the skills. All we have is an empty basket. But we're going to do what God has called us to do. First it's impossible, then it's difficult. Verse 18, Jesus said, bring them here. Then he told the people to sit down on the grass, and Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed to the people. 
they all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. People gloss over verse 20 all the time, and they catch the leftover baskets. For those of you that grew up in my era, if you ever saw a flannel graph, you know what the 12 leftover baskets look like. But that's not the biggest miracle in verse 20. It's an awesome miracle, but it's not the biggest one. The biggest one came before the comma. It says they all ate as much as they wanted. They all, not just a few, they all ate as much as they wanted. Do you know how hard it is to feed some people all that they want? When I was in college at CC's Pizza there in Springfield, if you had a college ID, you could get a buffet and a drink for $2.99. You know, all those Christian colleges, they close on Sunday nights. So for us Christian boys and girls, that was our club. That was where you saw the girl. You were like, hey, that's where the girls are at. Let's go to CC's, y'all. You're laughing. You went. I know. I knew a guy. He was a football player at Evangel. He ate 47 pieces at one time. I was like, how did you do that? I can't get past 26. <laughs> you, go, you go to a Chinese buffet and you see people and they're there, they're there for four hours. And like the, the, the owner's like, you get out of here. You eat too much. Like, get out. Mamas, how many of you have like junior high boys? And you go, you go down to the grocery store and you buy like $300 worth of groceries that used to cost 100 bucks. And you wake up Tuesday morning and your kid comes up to you like, Mama, Mama, I need a Pop-Tart. I bought 12. They're all gone. <laughs> mama, Mama, I need some milk. I bought three gallons. It's all gone. Junior high boys, they're impossible to feed all that they want. Yet here we have a story we got 5,000 men and their wives and their children, and they all ate all that they wanted. We know that they were in rows and columns. And so I imagine how hard it must have been for the ones in the back. Because the people up in the front, they're getting their food. By the time Peter and Andrew get halfway back, all of a sudden, Pastor Paul said, you know, that's really good. Give me some more. <laughs> Meanwhile, Larissa, she, she's still waiting. And then over, over here, like, Thomas and Bartholomew, they're, they're about halfway back. And Megan's like, I need some more, too. Meanwhile, that beautiful family back there by the flag of Ecuador, Guinea, where I grew up, they're like, Where's ours? All these people in the back watching the impossible happen for someone else and still not receiving it. How hard must that have been for them? Well, we know they received their miracle because everyone ate all that they could. But how hard must it have been for those people in the back watching the others get their first, their seconds, their thirds, and they'd get to receive their miracle. I talked earlier about pastors and youth pastors not having Bibles. The first youth conference we did was in the Cassese region, where we have about 70 Assemblies of God churches. And Megan asked the presbyter, Julius, she said, Julius, of your pastors, of your 70 pastors, how many of them have a physical copy of the Bible? He said, me. When we had the National Youth Leaders Conference, I looked around and I didn't see physical copies of the Bible. I saw phones, I saw tablets. I saw no study Bibles at all. And Megan asked our National Youth Director, Joshua. She said, Joshua, how many of these young leaders, our youth pastors, have a study Bible, a physical copy of the Bible? He said, maybe 20. Meanwhile, we've had our firsts, and we've had our seconds, and we've had our thirds. Every single one of us 
has a Bible. And in Uganda is English speaking. So it's not like we have to wait for a translation to happen, but we have pastors and youth pastors that don't have a physical copy of the Bible. And yes, it has been difficult, but we're seeing it happen. A VBS group down in Texas, not even in the Assemblies of God Church, they heard about it. They sent $1,500 and we were able to put 70, 70 study Bibles in the hands of youth leaders. A pastor from Arkansas heard about it. He said, I can do something about that. And in July, we're going to have 300 fire Bibles on the way to Uganda for our pastors and youth pastors and those in Bible school. It was impossible. And right now, we're still in the difficult phase because there's still more and more that need the Bible. But it's going to get done. We're in the difficult phase of finding a place to plant the church, raising the finances, that's why we're here. And it may seem impossible, but right now, we know it's not. Because of churches like you and churches all across this country that we know believe in reaching the lost and how important a local church is. And I know very soon we are going to see the first Uganda and the of God church planted in Kampala. And we are going to see amazing things happen in that church because nothing is impossible with God. In fact, when you guys go home today, if you have a dictionary in your home, a physical copy of the dictionary, I want you to go to impossible and I want you to take a magic marker and I want you to mark it out because if it's not in God's dictionary, it doesn't need to be in ours. Because first it's impossible. Then it's difficult. And just look around you today. It's done. It's done. And one day, we're going to look back and we're going to say, Megan, remember when we thought it was impossible to plant a church within walking distance of every Uganda? It was impossible until we planted one. And we planted it. And then that church planted another, and another, and another. And it was difficult. We had people that thought that we thought would be great pastors, but then they flaked out. But God brought other people. It was difficult to raise the finances and the support, but it somehow kept coming in. And one day, I can't wait until that day, we're going to look. And we're, I'm going to be able to say to my wife, and I'm going to be able to say, to Pastor Paul when we're at Maranatha, the retirement village. I'm going to say, first it was impossible, then it was difficult, then it was done. Because nothing is impossible with God. Looking at symbols of God, when you support missionaries like me and my wife and others, you are making the impossible possible. God is using this church. God is using you in a miraculous way. And I cannot thank you enough for what you are doing for the people of Uganda. And so I beg of you, don't stop because we're just getting started. Because one more time, let's say it all together. Nothing is impossible with God. Thank you so much, everybody. Nothing is impossible with God. Here's what I want us to do for the next moment or two. Number one, what has God been calling you to do that right now looks impossible? Not your ideas. I'm not worried about those. What is God calling you to do that has looked to be impossible? It might be starting a restaurant or starting your own business. It might be moving out to a different career that is scary for the moment, but you know the Lord is in it. What at the moment is impossible? Say, Lord, if this is what you're giving me to do, then I will do it. 
How many of you find yourself that you started the impossible thing and now it's difficult? This is where people give up. This middle part, this is where people give up. My encouragement for you is don't quit in the difficult. And don't forget that after the difficult comes the done. Here's what I want us to do. I want to pray a prayer of commitment for us as we get ready to to close this service, number one. Two, if the Lord has put something upon your heart, especially about giving to either planning a church or, or giving to Bibles, on your offerings coming up, you can put Uganda on it. We will make sure that that gets to Sean and Megan deal. You don't have to do that today. You can do that over the next few weeks. We will, uh, we will separate that. We want to help meet those needs. However the Lord might put it upon your heart, we want to meet those needs. Number two, I want to clarify. Only about like six people know that in the fall, I am teaching for about 10 days in the country of Uganda. It's not a secret, but I heard someone say like, oh no, they're leaving to Uganda. I will come and back. No, 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 you're good. Me and Julie are supposed to go end of August, first of September. We will take, um, we'll take about six days. There's 10 days, four days of travel, two there, two back. One day to hopefully see the start of the Nile River, which starts in, and then for six days, walking alongside the leadership of the Assemblies of God and teaching them how to preach and do expository preaching. <laughs> we'll see. The, I know Julie has to get shots. She's not real excited about that yet, but that's, that's, that's happening. So we'll be there to invest in on the ground to, to help train up leaders because we believe that everybody deserves to hear the gospel at least one time in their place in their home. So would you stand with us today? And I want to take a moment. I want to pray a prayer of commitment. So mighty God, today as you are calling your people forward, as you are calling us into arenas that are impossible and uncomfortable and difficult and challenging, Lord, may we not fear the places that you've called us to. May we not fear that voice that calls us to obedience and faith and belief. But instead, may we lean in to hear what is the Spirit of God calling us to do. For some of us, it might be to share a testimony on this platform. For others, it might be to use their gifts in the, in the commercial world, in the retail world. For others, it might be to leave all aside, to leave family and parents, and to go wherever you're planting us. But Lord, whatever you call us to, may we be obedient. And may we have joy in the midst of the journey. So Lord, help us not to quit too soon, but instead let us pursue all that you are calling us to, to be, and for. And may we see you do mighty miracles in Uganda, in Licking, Missouri, the United States of America, and the world. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord God, for your strength and for your power. And now as we go about our week, Lord, I pray, God, for great weeks for students, great weeks for teachers, for those who drive trucks this week, Lord God, may you keep them safe on the road. For those who work in our, in our governmental systems, Lord God, at the prison, Lord, may we see your light shine in the darkest of places. God, for those who are retired, may you give them opportunities to share their wisdom and their love for you with someone who needs that encouragement this week. And may we all be aware of what you're asking us to do in this day and this time. And Lord, we give you praise and we give you all the glory. We give you all the adoration. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful week, my friends. We will see you very soon. You better speak loud. You got lost them already. Got to speak loud, Pastor said, so I'm going to speak loud. Uh, Sister Julie asked me this week what we were going to do about the legacy meetings because the evening meetings were going to be uh, over for the summer. And I said, well, some, some folks are, are wanting to travel. Some are saying, let's have it. I felt to close that. God had other ideas. So I just want to let you know this morning that God wants to continue those legacy meetings on Wednesday afternoons. So uh, it's going to be difficult for Kay and I. Maybe for some of you, but we want to do what God wants us to do. So I need to be obedient and 
Let me invite you this summer, if you don't have any other place on Wednesdays, something else going on in the evenings, whatever, please come and join us. It'll be from 1 o'clock until 2 o'clock every Wednesday afternoon. God bless you.